Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on Canada-China relations policy responses to Hong Kong. I'm uh, Robert Faulkner, research, research associate here at the School of Public Policy and Immigration and Refugee Policy Issues. And with us today is Ayman Lau, communications officer at the McDonald Laurie Institute and also a fellow alumni of the Master of Public Policy program here at the University of Calgary School of Public Policy. Um, happy to introduce Ayman today, and we're going to be talking about uh, the current situation in Hong Kong and uh, Canada-Chinese relations and certain response that Canada can take in response to heightened tensions here. There will be a Q&A at the end. If you actually look um, either near the top or bottom of your screen, there should be an a box there where you can submit questions, uh, which we'll take from the audience and answer that after the uh, following presentation. But for now, thank you, Ayman, for joining us. Hello. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, greatly appreciated. And I do hope this webinar is informative. Um, I'm excited to be back at my alma mater, the School of Public Policy, doing this webinar with Robert. So yeah, let's, let's get this started. I, I did actually wanna start with a bit of a personal anecdote. I didn't expect to be involved with Canadian foreign policy to the extent that I am, um, but it certainly seems as if I was on a direct collision course with Canadian foreign policy, whether I was aware of it or not. And perhaps my first indication of this was in July of 1997. I was in Hong Kong and witnessed the handover, Hong Kong's return to China. Certainly isn't lost on me that an event, uh, to be frank, that I barely remember, has changed Hong Kong as we know it. As countries around the world are grappling with COVID-19, the Chinese Communist Party has seized upon this opportunity of international disorder to effectively strip Hong Kong of its rights and freedoms as the national security law or the NSL was implemented in July of this year. It may seem myopic to focus on Hong Kong, but I argue that to understand what has happened in Hong Kong allows us to be better informed of the Chinese Communist Party particularly as relations between China and Canada to, uh, continue to fray. Hong Kong was the warning, and unfortunately, I believe Canada and the world have missed many, if not all of the signs. While the implementation of the NSL may have been jarring to the international community, China's encroachment and now effective control of the territory was feared since the handover in 1997. Uh, the handover triggered an exodus of Hong Kongers who deeply distrusted the Chinese government and many have found new homes in Canada and this has resulted in a significant Hong Kong Canadian community of which I am a part of. The 2019 protests brought the geopolitical struggle between Hong Kong and China into sharp focus for the international community and I do think it's important to provide some context behind this. Britain gave back Hong Kong in 1997 under a special agreement, the Sino-British Joint Declaration, as many are aware of. This treaty stipulated that Hong Kong was to retain a high degree of autonomy despite being part of China. This meant that Hong Kong was afforded rights and freedoms such as the right to vote, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, and universal suffrage, which ultimately made Hong Kong starkly politically different from China. It's also well known that this treaty was set to expire in 2047, meaning Hong Kong would fully become a part of China. However, China has not waited and ha uh, waited at all to encroach on the territory's freedoms and rights. It is also important to understand Hong Kong's political system. Um, certainly, this is a summary. Um, there, it's, it, it's not, it, it was promised to operate it autonomously from the central Chinese government, but in reality has little separation from Beijing. The leader of Hong Kong, the chief executive, isn't elected by the people of Hong Kong, but rather the by the chief executive election committee, an electoral college consisting of 1,200 members. The chosen chief executive must be appointed by the central people government before taking office. However, the chief executive does not pass the laws in Hong Kong. That responsibility resides in the Legislative Council, or LegCo. LegCo comprises of 70 seats from multiple parties, uh, res which resembles uh, democ our democracy here as well. However, LegCo can be divided into two primary dominant factions, the pro-democracy camp and the pro-establishment camp, otherwise known as the pro-Beijing camp. 35 of these seats are geographical constituencies, meaning these seats of are elected through universal suffrage. 
people vote for their preferred candidate. The remaining 35, however, are functional constituencies. These seats are appointed by representatives of various industries in Hong Kong, with the majority representing the business sector. As China has great influence over the private sector, these 35 seats are incentivized to have a more pro-Beijing bent as it serves their interests. This is how, despite never winning the popular vote, the pro-Beijing camp has been able to control the majority of seats in the LegCo and certainly has exacerbated frustrations among Hong Kongers as they were ultimately promised universal suffrage. Um, and since returning to China, there also have been numerous attempts to erode Hong Kong's autonomy. In 2002, there were proposals for legislation to punish speaking out against the Chinese government, which was successfully fought off. In 2012, students and teachers rejected amendments to Hong Kong's curriculum to include China's history and national identity. It's important to note, education is a key tool the CCP leverages to suppress and control dissent among the populace, particularly after the events of Tiananmen Square. In 2016, the first pro-independence rally was held in Hong Kong, leading the Hong Kong government to clamp down on any groups or campaigns for independence. One such group, Hong Kong's National Party, was deemed an illegal society. And finally, it takes us to 2019, where millions of Hong Kongers took to the streets to protest the extradition bill proposed by the Hong Kong government, which would allow for the transfer of fugitives between Hong Kong, Taiwan, Macau, and mainland China. The inclusion of China was of great concern for the Hong Kong people. Uh, a lack of an extradition agreement with China is, was seen as an appropriate measure as China's political and legal system is fundamentally different than Hong Kong's. In fact, Hong Kong's legal sector staged its largest demonstration in the sector's history in opposition of the bill. The bill was widely seen as an erosion of the principle of one country, two systems that was enshrined in the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Due to the nature of LegCo, if the bill had been brought to it, despite mass opposition, it would have most likely passed. And the Hong Kong, though the Hong Kong government has officially, officially withdrew the extradition bill in October of 2020, uh, 2019, excuse me. So this brings us to the national security law that came into effect in July of 2020. Hong Kong was always meant to have a security law, but was unable to pass one due to the unpopularity of such legislation. However, China has decided to intervene with a legal framework to address what it sees as serious challenges to its authority. The details of the law's 66 articles were kept a secret and only released when the law was passed. The law essentially criminalizes any act of succession, subversion, terrorism, and collusion with foreign or external forces. Both the Hong Kong government and Chinese government has claimed that the law would only target a small minority, and most Hong Kongers would be protected under this law. However, key provisions of the law reveal the true intention to decimate Hong Kong's rights and freedoms and bring Hong Kong fully under the control of Beijing. Uh, some of these provisions, um, certainly not all of the provisions, but some of these provisions include um, that Beijing will have the power over the law, how the law should be interpreted to any Hong Kong judicial or policy body. If the law comes into conflict with any Hong Kong law, Beijing law will take priority. Those found guilty of violating the NSL will not be allowed to stand for public office. Companies can be fined if convicted under the law. Beijing will establish a new security office in Hong Kong with its own law enforcement personnel, neither of which would come under local authorities' jurisdiction. The office can send cases to be tried in mainland China, and some trials will be heard behind closed doors. Uh, a specific article which has received significant attention is Article 38, which extends the law to be applied to non-residents of Hong Kong. Simply put, anyone who travels or lives in Hong Kong but does not hold Hong Kong citizenship or PR status can be prosecuted under the NSL. So first and foremost, the NSL has the most direct consequences for activists and dissidents. However, who exactly is, to, is determined to be in violation of the NSL is still ill-defined due to the vague and arbitrary nature of the law. 
The application of the NSL led to the banning of the popular and widely used slogan of the 2019 protests, Liberate Hong Kong, Revolution of Our Times, which the Hong Kong deemed the slogan to be subversive and stated that anyone using it could be at risk for prosecution. So in fact, I may have put myself at risk of violating the NSL for just uttering that slogan. This flies in the face of the Hong Kong and Chinese government's claims that the NSL would be only applied to a small minority of Hong Kongers deemed to be a threat to national security. Rather, it demonstrates how the NSL can be arbitrarily applied to control and suppress any dissent, and more importantly, quash any efforts to galvanize movements threatening the CCP power. The application of the NSL also extends beyond Hong Kong borders and citizenship. In August, the Hong Kong government issued an arrest warrant for Samuel Chu, uh, the founder and managing director of Washington-based Hong Kong Democracy, Demo uh, Democracy Council, on the grounds that he has incited succession and, and colluded with foreign forces to endanger national security, violating the NSL. Samuel Chu is an American citizen and believes he is the first non-Chinese resident to be targeted by the NSL, but certainly not the last. Uh, the geopolitics of the struggle between China and Hong Kong has certainly spilled over onto Canadian soil. As Hong, Kongers took, uh, Hong Kong Canadians took to the streets in their adopted country, uh, many were met with fierce counter protesters and in some instances, things were turned physical as the two groups clashed on Canadian soil. Many dissidents and activists living in Canada run the risk of being subjected to harassment and intimidation in Canada, and there, there are well-documented cases of this. Additionally, as the Samuel Chu case has demonstrated, the NSL could be applied to Canadian Hong Kongers on the grounds that dissidents are actively colluding with foreign forces to undermine the security of Hong Kong and China. The NSL has also creeped into the education sector. A teacher was barred from teaching for life after allegedly using materials in touching on local independence. The teacher planned lessons, which included the study of banned pro-independence Hong Kong National Party, and students were also told to discuss the independence of Xinjiang, Tibet, and Taiwan. This was the first time a teacher's license was revoked due to education materials and have exacerbated fears of academic freedoms in Hong Kong. A student was suspended for a week for displaying a flag bearing the slogan, Liberate Hong Kong, Revolution Now, during an online class, and a music teacher was dismissed for allegedly allowing students to play Hong Kong's protest anthem, Glory to Hong Kong. The song is now banned in the wake of the NSL. This also begs the question for post-secondary educators here in Canada teaching international students from Hong Kong. Again, given the vague nature of the NSL, it's hard to know when and how the NSL would be applied. Educators in Canada may have to contend with censoring sensitive topics such as Hong Kong independence or Xinjiang, or potentially place, uh, risk placing Hong Kong international students in violation of the NSL for discussing such issues. And finally, uh, impacts on the business sector. So Alvin Chung in his testimony to the Special Committee of Canada-China Relations stated that the NSL could potentially have a chilling effect for Canadian businesses. Chung testified that the main attraction of Hong Kong is the perception that Hong Kong maintains the rule of law. A business operating in Hong Kong would want, to know, uh, would want the ability to anticipate what they can and cannot do rather than be subjected to the whims of state power. Um, Canada has had first-hand experience with the arbitrary nature of rule law in China, not necessarily under the NSL, but uh, due to the geopolitical conflict of arresting Meng Wanzhou and China, then China had subsequently engaged in economic coercion and halted canola and pork exports. The NSL, however, undermines this rule of law in Hong Kong and imposes a legal system um, with vaguely defined offenses and harsh penalties. To put it simply, when the, law, when the law applies to a business depends if the state wants to apply it to you. Furthermore, businesses operating in Hong Kong are certainly going to be under enormous pressure to publicly support the NSL and will have to choose between complying with the NSL and other regulatory regimes. For example, as uh, Alvin Chung testified, US sanctions. Finally, business matters may be characterized as involving and potentially violating the NSL. 
For example, a financial analyst who provides conclusions that could be deemed as undermining public confidence in Hong Kong or Beijing's government may be at risk of being prosecuted um, under the NSL. So how has Canada responded to these events in Hong Kong so far? Uh, when the NSL came into effect, Hong Kong did suspend the extradition agreement between Hong Kong and Canada, which is a move that is widely supported, and suspended the export of sensitive goods to Hong Kong. Uh, just recently, the Special Committee on Canada-China Relations uh, says that China has committed genocide against Uyghur Muslims and have recommended the government recognize these actions as a genocide and apply Minitsky sanctions against Chinese officials who are responsible for it. And then uh, in July of this year, Prime Minister Trudeau announced that immigration measures will be coming to support Hong Kongers seeking to leave uh, Hong Kong. But details of these measures have yet to be outlined. Past few weeks, we also saw the Immigration and Refugee Board had granted the asylum to a Hong Kong couple seeking to flee political persecution. And the Standing Committee on Citizenship and Immigration has approved the motion put forth by the NDP immigration critic, Jenny Kwan. And the motion pledges the committee to undertake a study to examine special immigration and refugee measures in order to provide a safe haven to the people of Hong Kong facing persecution under the NSL. So I think one of, uh, one of the key tools we have to leverage in our ways of responding to China and China's aggressive behavior is our immigration and asylum system. Immigration measures not only play a humanitarian role, but certainly can contribute to a robust foreign policy that strives to both uphold Canada's commitment to human rights and send a strong message to Beijing. And uh, at this point, I will let Robert take it from here. Hello, yes, no, uh, I'm going to actually invite me to jump in here just a little bit. Um, we recently uh, authored a, an op-ed for the Global Mail talking about uh, the use of our immigration and refugee system with regards to China. And so I'm not going to take the balance of the presentation, but I will just jump in here very, very quickly um, and then jump back into my moderator role. <clears throat> um, so a bit of context. Uh, Canada has received far more asylum claims from mainland China uh, than it does from Hong Kong. You'll notice there are two different axes here on the, the, the both graphs. One on the left one shows uh, asylum claims from mainland China, which usually average in the mid, around 2,000 per year, given uh, various circumstances on the mainland. Whereas in Hong Kong, it has a hover around uh, between 30 to 60 or so asylum claims. Um, this, so far in 2020, official numbers put the number of asylum claims at about 25 uh, from Hong Kongers. But that number is probably higher, uh, closer to about 50 or 60 range, since we haven't had updated numbers since um, the late spring, early summer. Um, now, I will say that one thing that's sort of stymied this a bit, of course, have been the COVID-19 travel restrictions. But that we should know that, that, that for that um, number or so early in the year, that is a significant spike in the number of asylum claims from Hong Kong. We also want to provide a little bit of history here about Hong Kong, about asylum as a foreign policy tool. Uh, one thing I can easily realize that um, is that back in our history that asylum was actually had a robust part of our foreign policy. During the Cold War, asylum was applied in intelligence gathering information, intelligence gathering operations, as well as um, soliciting messaging uh, that would be used by Canada and our allies in the ideological conflict between us and the USSR. Uh, Wesley Wark outlined how in the, in the wake of the Hungarian Revolution, the Canadian government recruited Hungarian freedom fighters uh, and debriefed them to gain valuable intelligence on what was going on behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, we also were enabled during that time the application for asylum at Canadian embassies and consulates, something that we currently do not allow, meaning that somebody could walk into a consulate, let's say in Moscow, and claim asylum there, and the Canadian government could decide whether or not to provide them protection. There was also an understanding that asylum and immigration were related to our trade relationships. In the United States, the 1974 jackson bannock Amendment um, was a direct response to the limitation of the Soviet Union on the exodus of Soviet Jews from that country. Uh, Soviet Jews had begun leaving the country, leaving the USSR in increasing numbers, going to Israel and the United States. And when the USSR began to limit their immigration from the USSR, uh, the jackson bannock Amendment said that the US would not lift certain trade restrictions on the Soviet Union 
until the Soviet Union allowed the exit of its citizens. So there are several benefits that came with allowing the exit or with encouraging the exit and flight of citizens from behind the Iron Curtain. The first was messaging. Um, when you're in an ideological conflict with another uh, power or entity, it looks a lot worse when the entity itself has to put up walls to prevent the exit of its own citizens. And, and the, with its, the attraction of those citizens to uh, your own entities. There was also the ability to trigger brain drain and capital flight from these countries, academics leaving them, and some of the times bringing uh, certain valuable items that they would then invest in the Canadian, American, or other economies of their newfound countries. And there was, of course, as previously mentioned, the important aspect of intelligence gathering, that um, many of these, many of these uh, defectors did have the opportunity to provide intelligence to Canadian, American, and other uh, intelligence agencies. Here on the bottom right, for example, you have Igor Bozhenko, who famously defected to, the, to Canada in 1945, just a few days after the close of the Second World War, and is often thought to be the trigger of the Cold War by uh, giving the Canadian government documents showing the espionage of Soviet citizens on Canadian, American, and British soil. That was the historical context of how um, asylum has been used as one, as one ability uh, by Canada to combat foreign aggressors. Um, but within the modern context, there, the, the role of asylum has somewhat shifted. Asylum since the 1990s has become much more generalized. Um, now the number of countries, like before 1990, there's predominantly countries behind the Iron Curtain that would send asylum seekers to Canada. Now it includes a variety of countries, some of which we would include among our strategic friends and allies, such as India and Mexico. Um, there are fewer in-country options for asylum seekers, meaning that it's now uh, harder to go to a Canadian embassy or consulate to claim asylum. And generally, our asylum policy since 1990 has been generally reactive versus proactive, meaning that we respond to migration flows from around the world, from conflict zones, but we haven't really used asylum as a proactive foreign policy measure uh, in recent years. But there are exceptions. Here on the right, we see the Rainbow of the Rainbow Refugee Program, also known as the Rainbow of Railroad. This is a program to help the exit of Chechnyan, as well as Iranian members of the LGBTQ plus community leave Iran and Chechnya and come directly to Canada. Um, there is a quote here in the Global Mail of a Canadian uh, government official. When they were asked why Canada was able to provide these people directly with asylum, whereas normally people have to first leave their country, in order to claim asylum, the Canadian government responded by saying a process was undertaken by which an exception could be made to some of those rules, meaning that some people could actually directly um, leave from Chechnya and Iran, come to Canada, and receive protection from the Canadian government. So there is a, pre a very recent precedent here. Um, there are other immigration measures that are, have been floated um, that may or may not be under consideration by the federal government. One of these proposed by the NDP immigration critic, Jenny Kwan, is to loosen family reunification rules. Currently, family sponsorship is limited to mostly immediate family members, um, spouses, parents, children, et cetera. Um, the Canadian government can choose to expand family reunification rules to extend family members, such as aunts, uncles, and cousins, uh, members of the Hong Kong diaspora who would be able to sponsor their family members from Hong Kong. Another option is to provide uh, specific Hong Kong dissidents uh, and activists with emergency visas. Uh, enabling them to come directly to Canada, similar to the uh, Rainbow Railroad program. Um, this would possibly probably work with uh, NGOs uh, working within the Hong Kong community, similar to how there were NGOs working within the Rainbow Railroad. That would help um, pinpoint uh, specific activists, and dissidents, or opposition members who are in need of an emergency visa come to Canada. If Canada wants a less, as it were, in-your-face um, measure, there's opportunity to um, work within our economic immigration system. Examples of these would be expanding uh, opportunity for young professional visas and student permits to Hong Kong, Hong Kong students, now the young professionals. Another option would be to work with again, NGOs, provide them with the opportunity to um, boost the number of points uh, they might receive within our express entry system. For those of you who are unfamiliar, our economic immigration system at the federal level gives a prospective immigrants a certain number of points based on their what's called human capital factors. These include their education, their work experience, their ability to speak English or French, uh, but also the ability to have a valid job offer or family members in Canada. The federal government could work with NGOs to provide uh, people with special codes that could in some way, either because of the country of origin or job offer or whatever, artificially give them a, a higher number of points enabling them to come to Canada under our economic immigration system. And finally, we could also allow for application for asylum at our overseas offices. 
between embassies and consulates, giving the Canadian government the opportunity to directly uh, grant protection to those who are fleeing persecution on the basis of their political opinion or nationality. I'm going to turn it back over the balance of the meeting back over to Hyman now uh, to discuss other measures the Canadian government could consider uh, that are not related to immigration, but might be uh, more in the area of national security, trade, and other options. Yeah. Um, so other measures that Canada has been should be considering or adopting um, are sanctioning Chinese and Hong Kong officials or Minitsky sanctions. There are numerous calls for this. Um, for their roles in Hong Kong and for the atrocities in Xinjiang against the Uyghur Muslims. Uh, another proposal is to diversify our trade relations and supply chains. One uh, such strategy is the Indo-Pacific strategy, which has been presented as a viable alternative uh, to working with like-minded allies in the Asia Pacific region. Another one is to encourage uh, more robust participation in the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the TPP. And this one is of great concern for Hong Kong activists and dissidents living in Canada, but certainly foreign interference um, in Canada by the Chinese government. It's both eroding our democracy here in Canada and subjecting uh, our own citizens to intimidation and harassment by the Chinese government. Certainly, this is just two ideas that have been uh, put forth, but there are a number of measures that certainly many want to see be put in place to safeguard our democracy and combat foreign interference. But one would be a foreign agent registry, and another is a more robust and transparent political donation scheme to simply track foreign donations that made to Canadian political parties. Uh, as we await the Canadian government's promised new approach and strategy to Canada's China policy. I once again urge and emphasize that we should be paying attention to what's happening in Hong Kong, not only Hong Kong, but in Xinjiang and Tibet. There are lessons that we should learn from if we are to move forward with a principle, realistic and concrete approach to the challenges posed by China to us. Thank you again for listening. And uh, Robert and I are happy to answer any questions. Yes, thank you, Ryman. Um, so just a reminder here that at the bottom of the screen, there is a Q&A option where you can actually submit your questions, uh, which will now take about the next 20 or so minutes to answer here. Um, first question. Uh, I'm going to gather a few of your questions here together. When there's similar questions, we'll kind of uh, lump them together to sort of provide one cohesive answer. So first one is regarding uh, news outlets in Hong Kong. Um, essentially, what has been the effect um, on news outlets in Hong Kong? And I'm, uh, specifically, uh, can international news outlets um, change that, for example, have changed, uh, let's say CNN, for example, um, can, what is the effect on news outlets both in, Ho in Hong Kong, both local and international? Um. Goodness. So right now what's happening is, again, as, uh, as expected, there's a chilling effect due to the national security law. Uh, certainly the Hong Kong government is trying to bring the press under control and to uh, kind of squash out any dissenting and crit critical opinions of the Hong Kong and Chinese government. Uh, there are concerns, I believe, goodness, I think there's a new accreditation um, proposed by the Hong Kong government and it's new accreditation rules for Hong Kong journalists essentially and I believe that it was um, implemented in September or not implemented but proposed in September of 2020 uh, and these rules effectively effectively demonstrate that if you don't play by our rules you can't report which has given a chilling effect to freedom of press in Hong Kong. The role of mm, CNN and these other, especially US-based um, US based journal uh, media companies, I do feel that we're going to be heading down a very rocky road. We saw what happened in China with uh, China expelling uh, American journalists out, uh, out of China it, uh, due to the spat between China and US. So I don't, 
I'm not too sure personally what kind of role any American-based uh, company may play. It's going to be a bit antagonistic for a while. Did you have anything to add, Robert? <laughs> oh, I think that that's pretty much it. Again, again, there's this this threat hanging over um, international outlets. Some have responded to it by focusing more on uh, apolitical news reporting. So, for example, um, uh, and I should say, in in, in the apolitical areas of political ads, you hear, of course, the big one, of course, if anybody's a sports fan, has been watching the response of various uh, sports networks and how they they deal with the China situation from the NBA hockey to um, other sport, uh, soccer and otherwise, um, including the censor, censoring of uh, various uh, players on teams who might have feelings for a specific situation in, in China or refusing to discuss certain um, sports related topics uh, with reference to China. Um, next question uh, has to do with um, the, the potential for an exit of, of Hong Kongers to Canada. So the question is, are we currently seeing a lot of the flight of large numbers of Hong Kongers to Canada? Mm -hmm. uh, and related to this, um, how do we address the issue of Hong Kongers not even being able to actually leave the uh, territory for Canada? So I think I'll point to Nathan Law's testimony yesterday at the special committee of China, uh, Canada-China relations in which, um, in which that he actually is not, he wasn't anticipating a mass exodus really, but it is more so just, we are looking, I don't think people will want to leave Hong Kong unless the situation is incredibly dire. And while the national security law has been implemented, it's still unclear how it's going to be implemented. So it's more so about providing options to Hong Kongers seeking to leave. Uh, for the second part, um, I, I think, uh, Robert, if you want to take that, <laughs> especially with uh, how China, Canada could respond to that. Yeah, no problem. Um, it is a difficult situation. I mean, the reality we need to recognize here with Canada that we are a middle power. Uh, our ability to respond in, in sort of a, an airlift is limited, especially when uh, the central government of Beijing might not necessarily allow such a thing. Um, I would say though that again, kind of going back to these immigration measures, is, is I think along with providing explicit humanitarian protection for Hong Kongers, I think trying to give them as many opportunities for various types of visas um, to come to Canada under what might be might be overtly non-humanitarian measures, but covertly provide them an, a, an avenue to to come into Canada. So, for example, I'll use the expansion of student permits. Um, Canada is now starting to allow uh, international students back to come to Canada. So if they can find a flight to come to Canada, they can arrive here and actually and start studying at a Canadian university, for example. Um, even if the uh, Hong Kong doesn't have an explicit intention to study, but that solely needs to access that visa in order to get to Canada and claim asylum, uh, providing um, various types of options for young professionals, uh, for people might come under our economic immigration system for family reunification, et cetera. All these provide what I call alternative avenues to the explicitly humanitarian option. Again, I, I recognize that might be a deficient answer for those who are specifically blocked um, from fleeing Hong Kong. And we have seen people try to escape through other means. So most famously, there was the 12th youths uh, who a couple weeks ago tried to flee Hong Kong by boat for Taiwan. Um, and, and that might uh, be the only option for those who are in the most restricted surveillance by the state in Hong Kong. But again, I think the best that we might be able to do here in Canada right now is, aside from providing explicit protection for some Hong Kongers, might be to provide them alternative avenues for accessing Canada's immigration system, whether through family unification, uh, work and study visas, um, or through our economic immigration system, even if that has kind of an artificial boost to their points. Okay, um, this is more of, and I, I want to say, uh, generally, uh, I and I tend to focus on foreign policy and immigration and refugee policy issues, but maybe I, if you might be able to describe what is the Indo-Pacific strategy and mm. um, how does that, that uh, play, what role does that play in, uh, in Canada-Hong Kong relations? Right. So the Indo-Pacific strategy, which has been pushed uh, by major think tanks and academic institutions here is 
Uh, basically, it's to work with um, countries and deepen trans-regional ties between the Indian and Pacific Ocean areas. So this would include countries like Australia, India, Japan, uh, Taiwan, and um, essentially what this would work is to help provide help provide Canada with kind of being able to subvert the economic coercion of China. I think one of the frequent narratives in Canada is that we are incredibly reliant on China and they are a significant trading partner. That, however, has been contested multiple times. And in a way, though, if this government were to work with other countries, um, especially now that Japan has been uh, or especially now that Japan, Taiwan has expressed their interest in becoming more self-reliant uh, on other countries other than China, we certainly can pr uh, put in preventative measures, essentially, I think, especially when we find ourselves in geopolitical conflicts. Um, to simply put it, I guess, and to summarize it, it's just to work with like-minded allies in terms of our trade and economic relations in that region. Uh, particularly Asian middle and small powers. Let's add on here. I think one thing that's important to recognize is that um, that we do have a trade strategy here as well. The TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, was actually formulated to be a, a trade block of, of, free, of free trading countries that would be able to counter um, Chinese economic strength, for example. We don't know what the outcome, of course, in November is going to be in the U.S., um, but a change in administration, one, one administration in particular might be more open to rejoin the TPP under renegotiated um, circumstances. And if the U.S. were to do so, that might also be a game changer there in, in increasing the economic strength of that particular trade block um, with, Canada, with Canada being part of that. Um, next question here. Uh, what is the foreign registry exactly? And who could mm -hmm. be added to it aside from, let's say, explicit diplomats from the People's Republic of China? So foreign agent registry was something proposed by uh, the former ambassador, David Mulroney. Um, uh, former ambassador to China, I, sh I apologize, uh, to basically, it's, he wants to suggest, he was, he was not trying to be alarmist to suggest that foreign countries continue to seek influence in Canada. Uh, the, again, as uh, we know, China's Communist Party has well developed mechanisms for influencing political opinion in foreign countries. So for the purposes of foreign agent registry, um, Mulroney defined that as a foreign agent in Canada, it, it, a foreign agent is a Canadian who actually lobbies or communicates on behalf of a foreign principal to influence Canadian policy or public opinion in Canada. So uh, in order to do so, and in order to structure this foreign agent re registry, uh, Mulroney actually recommends that we establish a registry of foreign agents to ensure transparency and accountability for former and high office uh, holders engaged in any activity for which they are paid by foreign principals. Um, and certainly this would also include prohibiting appointees to a federal board agency or foundation or council in Canada from serving as a foreign agent for the duration of their appointment and making those engaged uh, as foreign agents ineligible for Privy Council membership. Um, so it's a bit more than just, let's say, a registry to track, uh, but essentially the idea is that you can't claim or claim to serve um, both the Canadian government and someone who has paid you to influence the Canadian government on behalf of a foreign principal. Okay, next question. There, we are going to try to get to all these questions. Um, I should say there are about 30 of them now. So we are, we're all going to try to get to as many as we can today. Um, if you are, for whatever reason, don't have your question answered, you are welcome to email us or contact us uh, at the School of Public Policy. We'd be happy to try to answer those questions uh, through other means if we don't get to them. But again, we are going to try to get to as many of them as we can today here. Um, 
Okay. Um, this is, has to do more with uh, somewhat related to the, the foreign agent question. Um, mm -hmm. How I'm going to lump a, a couple questions in here. If we, for example, were to let more students into Canada, uh, if we were to let more Hong Kongers in, what's the potential risk for um, sort of foreign interference or espionage on Canadian soil? And are we already seeing that? How do we deal with that in particular? Uh, to be blunt, we have seen it. And the other blunter answer is we're not dealing with it. Um, the, if we do see and do accept more Hong Kong international students or Hong Kong citizens here in Canada, you can expect surveillance and espionage and intimidation to go up. Uh, especially if they are known activists or who are or are outspoken activists here in Canada. The executive director of Alliance Canada Hong Kong has documented, which is documented in a report to Amnesty International, detailed an account in which she receives harassing phone calls due to her activities with Alliance Canada Hong Kong. And uh, even though she had booked a hotel room in Vancouver prior, uh, when, where she had flown to do a media event for the launch of Alliance Canada Hong Kong. Even though that hotel room was booked under a different name, she received a phone call on her landline stating that uh, that was a very threatening phone call, stating that she was going to be, uh, someone was coming to collect her if she doesn't stop. The issue is among the community is that when they do report this, this is reported to police who don't have the necessary abilities to respond to such a concern. CSIS and the RCMP, they're both fragmented systems. We're not seeing a lot of collaboration between our intelligence and security services here in Canada to combat this. So, and again, another, another uh, case to illustrate this was the University of Toronto Scarborough student president, Chemi Lamo, who, um, was doxxed on social media, received death and rape threats, and had uh, was physically intimidated due to the fact she's an outspoken Tibetan and was elected pres uh, student president. So again, we haven't done anything. It's kind of the short answer to that question. <laughs> if I can add on here, I mean, one thing as well is um, what there, there's a, a, a yield of thread here um, on what, what we do choose to do. Um, there's been a lot of research showing that uh, there are economic and security losses involved with admitting a certain number of uh, international students and other uh, foreign nationals into Canada and the United States. Uh, but there are also large uh, gains in both security and economics as well. Um, so for a good, good example, of this is that in Canada or in, in the United States, uh, uh, Indian and Chinese students and HB2, HB1 and HB2 workers there account for less than 1% of the total population, but actually represent about 14% of the total new patents. And you know, they contribute a, a huge number of new inventions every year. There's also evidence to suggest that when, when we work in, in um, conjunction with American partners and Canadian partners, they also increase the productivity of their Canadian and American coworkers. Oftentimes you'll have teams that are composed of particularly one group or the other, but you have teams that are mixed from both foreign nationals and local citizens. And the economic gains from these and also the potential to gain intelligence from debriefings, I think are, are significant and huge. Um, the answer there then is uh, the, this night, we sometimes have a reactive um, decision to block the entry of all or most of Chinese or, or Hong Kong students or other foreign nationals. We realize that that's sort of um, killing the goose that lays the eggs as it were. Uh, the better solution might be to um, address the holes in our security system uh, through the Canada Border Service Agency, the RCMP, as well as CSIS, to do more robust security checks and criminal background checks of uh, entering students and workers and, and other foreign nationals uh, to fund them to be able to do those checks without, while also leaving a, a very large path open to students and other workers coming into the country. Next question. Um, I think this is a fair question to ask is, you know, there, there are other countries uh, around the world who don't allow secession from their, their own states. For example, Catalonia and Spain is one example that's been brought up here. Um, 
what, what, how do you respond to those who might say, well, um, China is taking reasonable measures to ensure the security and integrity of its country when, when other countries also have either other autonomous regions or also don't necessarily allow secession? First, first of all, it's not done in good faith. Um, again, we see how arbitrarily the rule uh, arbitrarily applied the NSL can be. And so far it's been applied in circumstances and efforts to quash dissent and criticisms of the Chinese government. Second, I point to the Sino jo uh, British Joint Declaration, which had beholden the Chinese Communist Party to uphold those commitments, but they have continued and ultimately now broken that international commitment with the world. And that, so again, that to me also flies in the face of Chinese government claims that the Hong, uh, Hong Kong is an internal affair. Moreover, I think it speaks broadly. So it, it's, it speaks broadly to the Chinese Communist Party and their ambitions rather than safeguarding Hong Kong's national security. Uh, they have, you have to understand that Hong Kong was a wound inflicted on China um, after the Opium Wars in the late 18th century when China lost and had to surrender the territory to Britain. Ever since then, it's been built into the national identity of China that Hong Kong is, a, is part of China and has to be fully under the control of China, despite international commitments being made that it would be able to retain a high degree of autonomy. You have to go back to the nature of the NSL and how vague and ill-defined it is and how political it has become. Not only is um, it being used for national security purposes, let's say, but it's also being applied to education sectors, to, um, to the business sectors. There is a report by Financial Times that stated that banks, I believed it was a leaked uh, document that stated that uh, banks are being asked to report any transactions that could be deemed a national security threat. These aren't done in good faith um, and certainly are meant to survey and control the Hong Kong population. Okay, thank you, Ayman. Um, the bit of going to sort of domestic Hong Kong affairs. Um, mm -hmm. To what extent does the sort of, this is maybe a, I'm combining a few questions here, folks, so um, just uh, bear with me. To what extent does, um, is there still a buttress within Hong Kong? Like to what extent, do, to what extent does the Hong Kong government have the ability to push back against encroachment by Beijing? For example, um, is there a court of appeals that Hong Kongers could access or other uh, parts of the judiciary that they could go to for a uh, fair rule of law, for example, both individual Hong Kongers, uh, private companies that may be impacted by the law, et cetera. Um, yeah, so to what extent is there, there, there still rule of law within Hong Kong and to what extent are there still recourses for Hong Kongers and Hong Kong companies uh, there in the territory? Uh, the short answer that I can give to that is uh, it's, it's minimal, um, especially now that we're seeing uh, institutions in Hong Kong being appointed pro-Beijing figures or even figures that are part of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so unfortunately, I, I don't believe there's much to push back with anymore in Hong Kong. Okay, thank you, Ayman. Uh, we have about 10 minutes here, folks. So if you have any questions, please get them in. Uh, again, we are going to try to get to as many of them as possible. If we do not, um, and you still want your question answered, please go welcome to contact us at the School of Public Policy or Ayman at the McDonald laurie Institute. Um, try, well, again, we're going to try to get to as many of them as we can in the next 10 minutes. Um, this is kind of a question more for, for, for me, but also I mean, feel free to jump in here as well. We've seen spikes in asylum claims in Hong Kong in the late 2000s. We've also seen, as of course, that in comparison to mainland China, there are a significantly higher number of, of asylum claims coming from the mainland. You know, shouldn't we consider opening up uh, asylum options for, for mainland Chinese citizens as well, and, and why, mm -hmm. well, why have we seen sort of previous spikes as well? A uh, short answer is that there, with regards to Hong Kong, there were actually a series of protests in the late 2000s. Again, the ongoing theme throughout all these protests from the late 90s to the current situation is that um, encroachment by Beijing on Hong Kong's economy. And, and back then there were serious concerns that um, there was going to be an erosion of um, uh, 
uh, of Hong Kong authority to be able to, to address rule of law, et cetera. Um, and that's so why we saw the, the spiking claims then. And again, I think we probably would have seen a higher number of claims now. And, and actually, um, if the, the, the 25 number, which is already publicly posted, is true, and if it's actually it's, it's higher on the 50 range, which we've seen some indication that that's the case, uh, that would be the, one of the highest years on record. And that was just in the first part of the year. Um, I suspect if we didn't have the COVID-19 related restrictions, uh, we'd probably see even more claims um, from Hong Kong. Um, one short answer is that uh, one thing the U.S. is doing, and one thing I think uh, the Canadian federal government is mulling over, um, is the extent to which we treat Hong Kong as in, an in, in independent territory uh, with regards to asylum claims. If you actually go on the Canadian government website right now, we have one bar or one row, as it were, in the statistics for uh, People's Republic of China, uh, and then another row for Hong Kong. And, and more and more countries are trying to recognize that as Beijing itself asserts its authority to dictate law within Hong Kong, why, why shouldn't we necessarily consider this one country for the purposes of asylum claims? And, and I think there might be some benefit to doing that. Um, one thing that should be known is that mainland, uh, asylum claims from mainland China tend to actually have a higher success rate um, than the asylum claims from Hong Kong historically have. Something because from, for a lot of its history, Hong Kong has actually had the rule of law and recourse is available to them there, whereas uh, perhaps citizens from mainland China have not. Uh, so as the Hong Kong judiciary becomes, and the Hong Kong legislature begins to mirror uh, central Chinese foreign policy. We might want to actually consider them as if they were coming from the same country and expand options that, that kind of capture both. And again, I think that might be the, the benefit of uh, Uyghurs, uh, Tibetan, and other mainland Chinese groups that flee persecution, as well as for Hong Kongers themselves also seeking to redress as well. So I think that's a, a reasonable question to ask under those circumstances. I mean, do you have anything that you'd like to add there? I mean, I think the only thing I'd like to add is Hong Kong used to be a safe haven <laughs> for uh, those who dissented against the Chinese regime. So we're starting to see now that is, um, I think with the numbers, it's completely shifted. But that's my only two cents on that. Okay, this one is a bit on Mong Wang Zhou. And um, uh, I hope I pronounced that right. I feel like every time I look at the right pronunciation, it's just a little bit. Um, but. Uh, if anybody has the correct pronunciation, please feel free to comment me if you want to get that right. Um, uh, combine a couple questions. What, what, if anything, could Canada have done to avoid being embroiled between um, two powers, in this case, uh, the United States, as well as the People's Republic of China? There were certain feelings that we could have done more on back channels to um, avoid this particular situation. We do, have, um, but uh, what could Canada have done to avoid being caught between U.S. extradition treaty we have, as well as our trade and other interests with China, for example. So personally, I, I'm not too sure what we could have done to avoid that, to be fully honest with you. Um, again, the position we were put in is yes, we were facing backlash on uh, China, the trading relations with China, but it also came at the risk of angering our closest and largest trading partner, the US. Uh, I, I think also, you know, maybe your question also speaks to this larger, larger narrative that we're stuck in between China and the US. And I certainly myself would push back against that. Um, I think it's important to recognize that China chose to A, uh, engage in economic coercion due to uh, being unhappy with our decision and B, also engage in hostage diplomacy. Um, that is their choice and their choice alone. You can, uh, now, don't get me wrong, I do have qualms about what's going on, on uh, south of the border with our neighbors. That's a whole different discussion. But we need to move beyond this idea of the US, the US China rivalry and understand that Canada as a middle power needs to have our own set of concrete principled and principled uh, approach to China. And understand that, yes, I don't know, it seems these days there's a reverse American exceptionalism going on that no country can be um, as bad as what's going on in the United States. But I'll push back and say that why, why are we trading with a country 
that has detained Uyghur Muslims and sent them to detention camps? Why are we engaging with a country that has decided an appropriate response to us arresting Meng Wanzhou, which was, illegal, uh, which was legal, was to engage in hostage diplomacy? So I don't know of what we could have done to avoid the situation. And yes, it certainly puts our China policy in a very precarious business situation, but I do think we need to move beyond this idea that we are stuck in between these two powers. Hey, thank you, Ayman. We're gonna um, finish up with one last question here. And actually, I think it's a good opportunity to sort of segue into some final comments from yourself, Ayman, after which we're gonna close the session. Again, sorry if we don't haven't got to your questions here. Um, again, we wanna reiterate that please feel welcome to contact us here at the School of Public Policy and the McDonald Laurie Institute, and we'll try to answer them. Um, but yeah, final question. And uh, then afterwards, I mean, maybe if you want to transition to any sort of final comments that you would like to like to make. Um, the topic of the webinar is Canada-China relations. In my opinion, Canadians are getting a very mixed message with respect to our relations with China, uh, especially from our current federal government. Um, we've all countries need to have dynamic cooperative relations in a global context. Uh, I realize that there is a significant political position required. However, this is a complex situation. And then actually, there, there's a couple other questions come on sort of a similar theme. I think the general theme here is we currently have a mixed message about our relationship with China and perhaps with the United States and other countries as well. Um, what should our message be? Like what, what, should, what should the direction of Canadian foreign policy be with regards to um, Canada-Chinese relations as well as our larger relations around the world? What, okay. Oh, I think that uh... A great example of what should be our uh, approach to our relations is Bob Ray at the United Nations, where he had a, uh, an incredibly strong and principled statement um, about what was going on in China and the human rights violation in China. And we saw that China had responded by giving consular access to, I believe it was one of the two Michaels, I'm forgetting, or both Michaels, um, for the first time in a few months. Really, it needs to be well defined. I completely agree that I do think there is a lot of mixed messaging or perhaps messaging that is not being communicated well by this government of how we're approaching China. So fundamentally, I think they need to have strong and clear messaging around what they're doing to address this is the first challenge they need to overcome. The second one is I think we need to stop approaching China as um, another political party that we can deal with in four four year cycles, like how can uh, four year cycle four year election cycles, just like how the Canadian democracy works here. That's not how the Chinese government works, and we need a bipartisan consensus to to work together to address the challenges of China and as uh, understanding. Again, do I think there should be debate on how we should approach China? Sure, absolutely. That's, that's a very key factor in um, moving forward, but we need to have an understanding of how the Chinese government operates and it can't be this idea that China is going to politically reform because they've de demonstrated over and over that they have chosen not to go down that path and they have resisted that path. Finally, I think in terms of how Canada wants to be seen to the world, we have a proud tradition of upholding human rights. And I think in some ways we have strayed away from that, um, not only in just our approach to China, but into our approach in Canadian foreign policy really. Um, and maybe it's just time to get back to that. And frankly, I think we do need a more courageous and a more principled stand against China. On that note, we'll close off the, uh, the um, questions and also close off the presentation. Uh, I want to thank Ayman Lau again from uh, communications officer with the McDonald Laurier Institute and former Master Public Policy uh, um, alumni. Uh, for joining us for today for this presentation. If you have any, if you felt that any of your questions um, have not been answered here, we would love to answer them. Uh, please feel welcome to email and we will uh, try to get back to you as soon as reasonably as possible. This, the recording of this presentation will be made available um, to attendees here. And um, we uh, look forward to seeing you at future 
uh, SPP webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.